you uh, I was reflecting on the trajectory of my thinking from McLuhan forward, mm. and McLuhan had validated the idea of not being a specialist, that you could do more than one thing. Maybe you would do them sequentially or might have actually multiple things going on at once. Mm. Um, and that was a very important notion for me. I, as a student, printed up little business cards saying, uh, you know, Ben Schneiderman, general eclectic. <laughs> Progress is not our most important product, uh, which was a play on the general electric uh, logo at the time or slogan of the time, which is progress is our most important product. So <laughs> the idea that you know a general eclectic would be, and I came to accept the idea I might not be the best at any specialism, but I might be the best generalist. Mm. So in that competitive atmosphere that I was in to succeed and to be the best of something, uh, I was accepting this notion of the best generalist, maybe. Mm a harder thing to do, and I would say professionally it's not an ideal choice, but it's been a useful, good, satisfying choice in my life. I think those who choose a specialist path and follow that and build on it and go down that road and go ever further have a easy path in their career and a, and a, a good way to succeed. I mean, it's not everyone succeeds with that model, but it's at least clear cut and you can see your progress more easily. Uh, my own approach had been to go from interest to interest, whether it was photography or physics and computing and applications of computing to very many different fields. I'm maybe well appreciated by some that I've collaborated with political scientists and English scholars and chemists and biologists, and I find these enriching. And so uh, these experiences have given me the rich set of multiple perspectives that I find useful for almost any problem that I attack. I'm also, uh, you know, I, I've enchanted by my discussions with you about history of science, about philosophy, about anthropology, and I'm only an amateur in these fields, but I know the often the references you make, I know the people you allude to, and I can make conversation uh, in a lot of different circumstances and people think I'm, you know, think I was trained in psychology because I'm able to, you know, talk about that literature and the methods quite extensively. Uh, they may think I'm in, you know, many different fields, and I ac acquire maybe narrow specializations. But I, I came to feel that, you know, after six months of working on a problem with political scientists about Supreme Court citations and district court and circuit court citations. Over the last 150 years, I was knowledgeable about the key issues there, and actually I could make contributions to that field, uh, bringing my own skill. I always respected you know, the other field and never pretended to be a political scientist, but uh, I would be partner with these colleagues to publish in the political science literature, and I would publish in the computer science literature with my students about the generalizations of those ideas. So the capacity to look at a problem, both from the specialist solution of a, a known problem to generalizing to other problems is probably my best skill and claim to uh, the repeated, I would say, successes that uh, I've had. And that's, I think, an important principle that I like and I follow uh, in an explicit way. Um, I would say, I had sort of one footnote about that, I would say, in, uh, I guess, five years ago, six years ago, began to work uh, on biolo with biologists, molecular biologists, about uh, gene expression data analysis. And I found that to be terrifically fascinating, but a bigger mountain to climb than any one I had done before. And after three and a half years of working on that, being productive and you know, producing results, I still did not feel I had achieved that proficiency to be able to discuss and carry forward in that. I had a weaker high school biology training, and you know my the the gap between what I knew and what I needed to know was quite large, and so I worked hard on that. And we have very nice publications in the biology field for the tools we develop, and also in the computing field. But the biology papers, which are you know the typical thirty author papers, and and I felt that our work deserved acknowledgement, maybe, and referencing. 
But they said, no, you know, their ethic in biology is that everybody's name goes on this. And so there are papers which I'm the author of, but I, I, I could not explain them to you adequately. Uh, it's a, a, a challenge to me because the conflict among disciplines and the way of working is, uh, you know, uh, unsettling, I would say. And I, I felt for a while to put those biology papers in a separate section of my resume because I didn't feel that I could claim the content of those articles. And they're important articles that are widely referenced and uh, have been influential, but I, I don't, I was not familiar with the strategy of the biology community of having these multiple authors. And it's certainly different from computing where individual author or small groups would be the typical thing and still different from many other fields, and typically history and humanities, where single author papers and books are the, 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 the main way of going about it. So I came to be aware about the different publication strategies in different fields, and this eclectic style suited me, and I enjoyed the sequential uh, relationships with professionals in different fields to solve their problems and stimulate our work in terms of new, new problems. So the current example of electronic health records is yet that problem again. I think working on medical computing is a noble application of computing, which is in harmony with this tikkun olam notion of mending the world, of working on medical care is a wonderful uh, opportunity for me. And yet I think you know we also broaden computer science, not merely by its application, but by bringing new problems that have not been attended to in computer science. Similarly, with English uh, researchers, uh, literary scholars, uh, my colleagues think because I collaborate with them, I'm doing a favor to these English professors, or you know, they rather disparage true interdisciplinary work. Uh, but I can assure you that these English scholars are brilliant in their own way, and the challenges they bring to us are novel and important expansions of, of computer science and the algorithms are to me equally fascinating and, and challenging. So by having this sequence of collaborations and working in these interdisciplinary teams and uh, I do have to establish the ground rules with scholars that we're not there as their programmers but we're there as partners and I need to be able to publish in the computing literature and publish with them in their literature and that my students need to get a PhD in computer science, not merely um, you know, programming for them, they come to understand that, that way of working. And I think we've been successful as a group because we kept explicit several of those principles of we'll work with you on your problems, but we publish on our problems and the generalization of those ideas. And the inspirations from these different disciplines enriches me and gives me confidence about whether a solution is going to be generalizable, powerful, difficult, or easy. And I would say the breadth of my reading is, uh, is great. I mean, I think it's, I'm just, I read a lot of different areas, and I'm satisfied with my capacity to read in different areas of computer science, but the broader reading in other disciplines and knowing some of that, a taste of them at least. And... Uh, enough to make discussion with scholars in many other fields. So I like that part. So do I. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I enjoy yeah. talking to you as well as we have done. Um, let's get back to the timeline, so to speak. Um, uh -huh. have it, at the end of yeah. your undergraduate, what yeah. we call our undergraduate degree, what, what did you do It's then? a worthwhile point to include, and certainly was an influence and a turning point, maybe, I, as I graduated from City College with a um, bachelor's degree in math and physics, there was no computing at the time, but that was what I was left with. Um, and I was looking to go to graduate school in computer science. And by that point, I was already more knowledgeable about what universities were good or bad or where to go. And the favorite place for me was Carnegie Mellon University to work with Alan Newell and Herb Simon who were at that time doing leading work in what was the early stages of artificial intelligence. Mm. Uh, and I was quite excited. I went to Pittsburgh, paid my down payment. Mm. For the, I was very excited that there was a teletype in the basement of Mudge Hall where the 
would be my dormitory and that there was access to computing facilities and Newell and Simon were leaders in these new areas and uh, were other, many other, I mean, the head of the department it was Alan Perlis, a famous computer scientist, and I remember coming into his office and I understood he was head of department and he was this large bald-headed guy <laughs> and it was sort of a striking kind of uh, encounter. Uh, so the thrill of going to work for Newell uh, was uh, very much on my mind, but it was the time of the Vietnam War, and the U.S. draft boards, which decided on people's admission to the military or not, had said that my going to graduate school was not an acceptable deferred uh, occupation, and I would be drafted. And so Carnegie responded, they had given me a fellowship to attend there, they gave me then an instructorship, so I would be working. I returned to my draft board, and draft boards were local, and each made their own policies, and my board said no, they, it was not an acceptable deferment. So that was really uh, problematic, and I wound up then going to teach at a two-year college on Long Island outside New York called Farmingdale, uh, and I was... Uh, invited to be an instructor over there, full-time uh, instructor in this department of data processing. Uh, Harold Highland was the department chair and he took a liking to me and uh, he had a son my age who was in similar circumstances so he felt he understood he was helping me and at age 21 I wound up teaching in front of you know, college level audiences often older than myself. Uh, but my draft board felt that that was my national service. And so I went and taught 15 hours of classes a week um, of Fortran and data processing equipment in a very more vocational environment. But that was quite wonderful. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was this distinct feeling. You teach people a very professional skill of a certain kind, and they go get a job doing that. And since it's more local, the student's likely to return and tell me that they got a job because I taught them this stuff. And so that was gratifying for three years, and I worked hard. And that's how I came to be at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, also on Long Island, near Brookhaven Labs. Um, but it was a new university, and so I came to take classes there, and I was, uh, computer science was now emerging as a discipline. There was a department, but no degree yet. And I was also doing applied mathematics, so that would have been the degree. Um, and uh, I became the first PhD in computer science at Stony Brook, so it's well remembered in 1973, and mm -hmm. I'm invited back on five-year anniversaries <laughs> and, as sort of the uh, the first PhD, and you know I'm appreciated for my accomplishments there too, and, and quite warmly welcomed. Another colleague of mine, time John Hennessy, is now the president of Stanford University. Mm -hmm. Became. Uh, so we had a good group there, and maybe a good story also, another one of my college, uh, graduate school colleagues was a guy named Isaac Massey, uh, who I'll come back to, but it was a very good group and it was a good experience. Uh, although the university itself was not a supportive environment, it was a new place that didn't have services, and I guess my memorable moment outside my office, I was an instructor, I, I, I came there as a graduate student and then they offered me an instructor position finally. Um, and outside my office there was an open steam vent to where they were working on it. One night a student, this was unlit and unmarked, fell into it and died. And it was that kind of, uh, you know, lack of care or attention which sort of typified the worst of it. There. On the other hand, I had a couple of excellent instructors, Herbert Gelernter among them, uh, an early pioneer in artificial intelligence theorem improving, geometry theorem improving. Uh, who was wonderful. I just was sitting in his class in awe. This is a recursive function theory, and I just thought this was, it's just mind-blowing ideas of recursive function theory, provability, good and completeness, and so on. But doing the proofs were, it was just magnificent. I just was owing and I, you know, <laughs> agonies of uh, just pleasure of, uh, of, of understanding these things. So he was a memorable um, uh, professor who I had for several courses. I will, I remember quite um, vividly though my conflict with him. I had gotten excited to write programs to do some of these theorems or prove things. And I, I offered to do 
a, a theorem-proving program, which was pretty ambitious effort, if he would excuse me from the midterm exam. In, in its place, I could turn in a, you know, pretty ambitious effort. I thought I could manage that. And he said no to me. And I, I really, uh, really annoyed me. Uh, but I think he may have been right, you know, he may have been right to force me to do the, the basics there rather than sort of go out on this adventure of programming. But uh, I, I, it was really troubling to me. Uh, my own professor there was Jack Heller, who was working on databases and mathematical theory of databases. But we had, it was there also I learned this sort of practical connection because he had been working on museum databases and we worked on the Museum of Modern Arts Fine Arts catalog and cataloging that. And my dissertation was essentially a theory of these richer data structures called the Graph Theoretic Model of Data Structures. And so uh, it, it uh, had the application of working from the Museum of Modern Art, but it had the generalization of a mathematical theory of graphs. And I was able to apply graph theoretic strategies to making efficient models of how to implement these things. And um, I had f begun the dissertation writing process in the way that I now work with my students, uh, where I think traditional approach would be to do your work, then write your dissertation, and then publish papers from that. And I think many disciplines still follow that. Um, but I was much more into doing the work, publishing a paper, and publishing four papers, and then writing it as an integrated document to make the dissertation. So the advantages there was it was in harmony with my social approach, that is, get your work out there, let people read it, and criticize you, and find out what's wrong with it, in time for you to make changes and adjustments to this. Uh, and so, and it also pushed me towards having the work done soon enough that it could have impact on the Museum of Modern Art, the United Nations projects, and other museum projects that Heller uh, was working on. So the uh, other point is that real work should be applied. I don't subscribe to the strong separation between basic research and applied research. I think you are, you do your best basic research if you have a real problem to work on. And I, to this day, follow with my students, even undergraduates, you must have somebody outside the classroom for who you're building this. You need a user, you need a problem that they, that somebody else cares about. And your goal is to solve their problem and ensure that your solution survives beyond the end of the semester. And that's, that's been a very productive approach for undergraduate, graduate, and also for my work with students. We don't take on projects unless we have a real user with a real problem. So working on electronic health records or with a group of physicians who are looking at real problems in the medical world. I see so many times papers that are done in an abstract way, and it's true, maybe 20 years from now someone will find an application for this, but I don't have that time to waste on problems that are so abstract. Uh, I think you get your best work when you have a real problem that somebody cares about and when you present a partial solution and they can criticize it, they can tell you what's wrong with it, they can suggest improvements, refinements, and you come back and get a better solution. And I, I think that driving force is extremely uh, powerful. So I think you get the best theory when you're working on real problems. How did you come across the work of COD? Ted COD? Mm. Of course. Did you meet him? Sure, quite often. And he, he was a, a god in these parts. You know. <laughs> god so, the god. Yeah, he was an RAF officer, very British mustache, and a wonderful character. I have many photos of, of him, but I was a very early player in that space of relational data model. Yeah. And he was a wonderful inspiration. And mm -hmm. his February 1970 paper in the communication mm -hmm. ACM certainly was one of those important, brilliant moments where he not only presented an idea, but presented its ramifications in rich ways. I was at the time working on those problems and visited him at IBM and many other occasions. Because we, a colleague of mine, yeah. brought um, the relational database mm -hmm. model from the IBM center at Peter mm -hmm. D and down to Cambridge and mm -hmm. did, wrote the first relational yes. database in and Cambridge. We told that story, right? Also. Um, so we were tied up. We were yeah. working in parallel in different mm -hmm. parts of the world. Fascinating. So, was was this um, work you've just been describing? Was it um, 
study book, that was a PhD, and then what yeah. happened at the end of that? Right. So, uh, just you know, more about my the strategy of producing the PhD, where yeah. writing the, these papers, and one of them um, was published. When was it? But it finally appeared in 1973 in the communication of the ACM and made the major publication. And it was called Optimal Database Reorganization Points. And one of the issues at that time, databases, as you added new items or deleted items, they would become less efficient and each successive query would take longer. And so your desire is to reorganize often, but that's costly and so you need an optimum strategy. And I had a very lovely solution for that that had a nice closed and intuitively understandable, uh, made, made good sense. Mm -hmm. It was a nice mathematical proof for the simple case and a general mathematical solution for the more elaborate case. It was a fairly mathematical piece at the time. Uh, and it, you know, stimulated, it was one of those great things as a graduate student or a young researcher because it sort of, it, it, not sort of, it stimulated 35 papers in the next few years on this topic and opened up a new field. And it was a great, uh, a nice success story. And so as a graduate student, that's the kind of thing you want to see happen. And that was one of those components of the dissertation. Uh, other parts didn't have as much a, a profound influence, but this graph theoretic model turned out to be a good way to look at data structures and databases. And so it seems obvious and natural at this point to people to look at it that way. Uh, there's a nice story to tell about uh, along the way as a graduate student. Again, my eclectic and diverse side was exploring other branches and I had been as a graduate student a volunteer uh, for the ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, at a professional event that hosted the British software engineer named Michael Jackson. Uh, and he came to speak in New York and I was there and I helped them organize in exchange for my free attendance at this. And, he was then proposing these new notions of structured programming that Edsger Dijkstra is often associated with. Uh, and it was a new way of looking at programming rather than the go-tos of Fortran. It had a set of structures of if-then-else and do-while structures. And so there was no go-to structure. And uh, um, Jackson presented this idea and it was one of those things, it wasn't an aha moment, it just seemed obvious, a sort of a natural jump that if you don't have these go-tos, then the flow charts that were popular of arrows connecting to boxes were also not valuable and that you had these recursive structures of if-then-else and looping structures and sequential execution. There was a nice mathematical proof that those three structures provided you all the power that you needed in programming every function using only those three structures. So I began to draw boxes nested within boxes and developed a set of, of box shapes that would represent this and just was a 15 minute invention while listening to his talk. I returned to Stony Brook and showed my colleague Ike Nassi, Isaac Nassi um, these things because he was working directly on that in his dissertation and he said yeah this is great and he yeah. got excited and he knew the justifications and why and so together we wrote this up and he helped expand the idea and, and justify it and we called them uh, structured flowcharts mm -hmm. and uh, for which you are famous in which I am they are known as Nasi Schneiderman yeah, diagrams right. NSD uh, Nasi prevailed on me to make them alphabetical order <laughs> of the uh, authorship uh, but that was that's okay and so we submitted this for publication in the communications of the ACM. I've mentioned already, and it was returned in a few weeks, very quickly, rejected. And the rejection letter, which I've scanned and is on my website, says the author should collect all copies of this paper and burn them. And I have never received such a strong kind of nasty rejection, but I guess I felt humbled by this as a graduate student, you know, getting this kind of a fierce rejection. But, you know, I felt like I was on to something, maybe, you know, with provoked such a strong reaction, while others thought this was clever, innovative, useful. Uh, and, and so I had sent it to a few people. Uh, one, a senior colleague who I respected, and he didn't respond. But a few months later, another colleague sent me tear sheets from a popular computer science magazine, which 
he had published this idea under his name, and he had used his name to, you know, label them. And that was really troubling as a graduate student. What am I to do when this senior person has done this? People said I should file a complaint to the Professional Society. I just left it. And for many years it troubled me because many of the books mentioned his name. Eventually this got sorted out and it's widely known as Nazi Schneiderman diagrams. There are, uh, we then published this in a non-refereed newsletter of one of the professional sites, SIGPLAN, Programming Languages. And it, you know, there are thousands of citations to this unrefereed paper. There are hundreds of software packages. There are, you know, patents that follow this. There are internet. There's an international standard for doing these things. And so, again, it was one of those wonderful 15-minute innovations that I did very little to promote, uh, but traveled very, very well. I mean, it's, you know, one of those great things, and uh, it's less used now as are most of these diagramming techniques. It's, it's still widely used in Germany, where they're called structograms, but uh, it was a great episode and another story about the paths of creativity yeah. and how certain ideas travel well, and maybe the first hundred papers were variations on the theme and extensions to it and amplifications and they were ways of taking it to another level. It was one of those simple ideas that people could understand that was a jump in a way. It was a different way of looking at the problem and opened up the door to many possibilities. And I'm aware that good contributions are not ones that solve a problem and end it, but they open the door to new, new possibilities. So that was the episode as a graduate student of Nasi Schneiderman diagrams. I finished my degree in 73. Uh, and uh, took a position at Indiana University as assistant professor, uh, recently married, and uh, went off to do my service to the Midwest of the U.S., and Indiana was a good university, a state university. I was, at that point, I would say quite strongly motivated, having gone to City College and the good educational system of the public schools in New York, and then went to Stony Brook, the State University of New York, I was imbued with the notion of doing service at these state universities. And so um, it was an attraction, and going to Indiana was a, a good way of getting to a different place. It's a small university town in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, where there's a, it's a lovely campus, and uh, there were five of us, uh, junior professors hired the same year. Amazingly, five guys with families, all five Jewish. <laughs> you ask about the, but it was sort of an amazing thing that here, I mean, there was no precedent in the department. Here was this sort of Midwestern non-Jewish community, but they fired, hired five Jewish guys. And <laughs> so we became close and, you know, all had children. And, and so it, it was a nice experience for three years, and that was a good time at night daughter Sarah was born in Indiana uh, in 1975. By the end of that, uh, th after three years, it was enough. It was a good place. It was tranquil. It was good to start a career, good to start a family, but the desire to get back to the East Coast and maybe the tranquility of the Midwest was good, but the neurosis of the East Coast was <laughs> better, <laughs> more attractive somehow. And so uh, I would have liked to have been closer to New York, to family, and to all that circle there. And my wife uh, wanted to be further from her family, which is also from New York. Mm. And so the compromise was to come to College Park, the University of Maryland. Um, University of Maryland. Yes, yeah. right, which is just outside of Washington, mm. D.C. And there was a particular attraction there because... Uh, there was a senior faculty member named Ed Sibley who was the head of a small department called Information Systems Management, which dealt with the database issues for which I was making my reputation, very traditional computer science work. I was yet to, well, I was beginning to think about these psychological issues that I should add to your story. But uh, Sibley was interested in my work on, on these experimental studies of programmers initially. I had learned my trade as a psychologist at Indiana University, which was a first-rate psychology department when B.F. Skinner had been the senior faculty member. And one of the young faculty members there, Richard Mayer, um, 
taught me psychological experimentation, and I taught him about computing, and together we did some good work. He's gone on to a distinguished career in psychology and was at University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, and uh, uh, so that was a good partnership, and I was gaining some reputation, had some very nice early studies about programmers, uh, maybe just to make a bridge. When I was at City College, I described working on Fortran, and my friend Charlie Kreitzberg and I wrote a little guidebook to programmers about how to do good programming in Fortran. There were sort of good and bad ways to solve problems. And we eventually wrote this up in a book called The Elements of Fortran Style, which was published in 19, it's a good question, 71? Maybe some, yeah, it must have been 71 or 2 or something like that. So I was 25 years old when I published my first book. Uh, it was a small book based on the Strunk and White book, The Elements of Style for Writing English. Mm -hmm. And that kind of allusion to writing good Fortran was very much on my mind. And it had a moderate success and inspired a whole series of other books. Kern Hans and Plower's more famous book, Elements of Programming Style, took that idea and built on it. And they, they, made a very successful, more general book on programming. And there were many other elements of X style for many years. Uh, but we certainly started that trend. And it was uh, a set of rules about how to write good programs, about choose of, choice of variable names, modular design, indentation, commenting, variety of stylistic issues. And those were really conjectures, or based on our experience in writing code and in helping others. I became imbued with the notion of conducting empirical tests where I would make a good and a bad version and then give it to somebody to debug or to interpret and I would measure their performance. And so I was able to alter the independent variable and measure the dependent variable and that's the way these experiments began. So I was quite interested in these psychological experiments and when I came to Maryland, it was attractive because this information systems management department was in the behavioral and social sciences school, not in computing. And so that was a very interesting opportunity and it was close to the psychology department. And so I was attracted to that. That was a good thing in Maryland and this senior professor, Ed Sibley, uh, was, had been a collaborator and he had been helpful to me. I had, early on, he had engaged me in doing short courses around the country, around the world. I was early on giving lectures about these new database technologies, relational and other models, from you know before I got my PhD. So I was quite well featured on the lecture circuit and would go to Brazil or Europe or you know, around the US and do be part of a three day course on these new technologies and do a half day. And Sibley was the organizer often of that. So I came to know him and appreciated what he wanted me to come to Maryland. And we had a very good group at Maryland, which did well, but it was a small group and eventually lost the political battles. That department was dissolved, and most of the faculty left. Um, two of us went to computer science, so I went to my natural home. Now, I wasn't especially welcome there. I mean, they accepted me because it was a free line, and the university had reorganized around these, uh, this, this notion. Uh, but I was seen as sort of a little different because I was into these psychological studies uh, and, you know, that was not especially uh, celebrated. Uh, but, you know, that's what I've seen as you bridge to these interdisciplinary and newer areas. You're going to have trouble with some fraction of the established community. Uh, and I've always, you know, dealt with that pretty straightforward and understood that what I was getting into. And yet, I did it. You know, it wasn't necessary. I had to please everyone. I had gotten my tenure based on my traditional computer science stuff and had good respect because I, you know, I had demonstrated my mathematical skills and abilities with this stuff. I had sort of reputation for the optimal database reorganization points, for the Nasi Schneiderman diagrams. So I was already a known figure at that point. I was doing these lectures and I was, you know, I was on the circuit. You, you enjoy lecturing, obviously, and teaching. And sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah, it's great fun. We don't find any conflict between that and any of your other work. Indeed, it feeds into it from what you I know. think so. I always, I would say I made it, made sure it did, because 
early on when it was difficult or impossible to get funding for research on these psychological experiments of programmers, I would put my students, including undergraduates, to work and I would make their semester projects to be an empirical study. And uh, often I was most proud to be able to publish in professional journals with my undergraduates. That was sort of my featured you know, kind of thing. Now, of course, colleagues disparage that because they say, well, if the work's so simple that undergraduates can do it, it can't be very good. And, you know, it was still a novel thing, so it was threatened, threatening to many. Uh, but I had done the mathematics, I had taught numerical analysis, I can do that stuff, okay? Uh, and I moved on to these newer forms, and that was fun for me, and so that was the uh, justification. It wasn't, it wasn't just your undergraduates, it was even your own family. I remember hearing a story from your daughter, Sarah. Yeah, and, uh, she was a guinea pig for <laughs> one, of, one of your best known books. Um, <laughs> can you tell us this story? Well, sure. I mean, there are nice ways that you put this together to work in the real world. I remember when Sarah was in third grade, maybe fourth grade, third or fourth grade, her computing was all the rage at the time. And so her teacher came and asked me to recommend a textbook for them to use to teach these kids basic, the language basic programming. I looked at what I found, I was really appalled. There were either trivializations, which gave you a program and said, type this in, and it didn't really teach you programming. Or if they taught you programming, they depended on high school mathematics. And so I quickly wrote them about 75 pages of you know, programming introduction. I had, I had already I'd written the elements of Fortran style, and Charlie Kreitzberg and I then collaborated on Fortran programming, a spiral approach it was called, which was based on psychological theories about programming. And that was a huge success. There were 200 books on programming on the market, and Charlie convinced me that we could do better, and we did. And we wound up um, becoming the dominant book in that field. Uh, so I was fluent with writing these kind of things. And I quickly wrote them, whatever, 75 pages, where the examples were all graphical. You print words, or you print a ladder shape, or some circles, or boxes, or big letter A, or mm. these kind of examples where kids could understand. And it was worked well for her, her class. The DC school system then asked me to polish that up, and they printed 3,000 copies for summer computer camps that were the rage in those days. And then it got published in four different computer versions, IBM, Apple, Commodore, and one other, uh, Atari, I guess. So we published and And Sarah was, in that case, I think that's what she's remembering. The, she worked through the problems, and she was sort of, the, each book had one child who worked through the problem. Their picture was there. They worked with their parents, and so. It worked out pretty nicely. <laughs> I thought she was going to tell other stories because she was, I mean, as she remembers often, you know, I used to help them with their, their science projects and mm. doing experiments mm. in that way. And I, I remember one of them was using the sound generator on a uh, computer to generate sounds of different pitches and different volumes. And the question was, what was the just noticeable difference that people could determine? how big a difference in amplitude or in frequency were noticeable to people on a reliable basis. So it was the kind of experiment that I helped them, them do. Yeah. We've got 20 minutes or so. Yeah. Um, so it would be, it's really your choice, but it perhaps mm -hmm. um, come on to your more recent work. Yeah. And this, this whole um, computer human interface mm -hmm. uh, area that interests you. Yeah. I would say that's probably right. I mean, that's certainly what I think my major impact has been. I mean, I'm proud of all the pieces along the way. But um, by 1980, I had taken the different work uh, that I had been doing on experimental studies of programmers and wrote a book called Software Psychology, a kind of marriage of disciplines. And it was published by Little Brown, a fine publisher, but they were actually Winthrop was the initial publisher. Uh, and they thought they'd take a try on this sort of wild idea. Uh, but both of the computer science book of the month clubs took this as a selection. And so it suddenly became a hot topic. And by 1982, a group of us were meeting in Washington. I had been the organizer of the Software Psychology Society, we called it. 
which, whose claim to fame was no members, no officers, no dues. Uh, <laughs> but we had a mailing list of 600 people, and 40 to 60 people showed up each month at George Washington University, where one of our colleagues provided three dozen donuts and coffee for a Friday morning meeting, and I organized the visitor, the speakers, and for 20 years this was a very influential group that uh, had, of course, local but also national impact. And we decided to run a conference in 1982 where we hoped to bring together two or 300 people on this topic. And it was held at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, at the time National Bureau of Standards, in Gaithersburg, Maryland, outside Washington. And uh, we drew 906 people. <laughs> it was suddenly this startling thing where people were interested in this topic. The personal computer had appeared. We were still before the days of the Apple Macintosh, but these ideas were beginning to grow, and the work of Doug Engelbard and others began to show the promise of personal and interactive computing. And so the interest was strong, and it helped launch that topic. The following year, the ACM's Special Interest Group on Computer Human Interaction was formed, and they took over the conference, and it ran in 83 in Boston and has continued to be the main source, drawing as many as 3,000 people a year, and that professional group remains a strong one. So I'm proud of my contribution to making that, that group go, and to this topic, and that bridge of disciplines was a natural spot for me to be in, and um, I'm pleased that it has succeeded in a certain way. Uh, most computer science departments have a course called Human-Computer Interaction, or something like that, there's still resistance among many, and maybe the more, you know, some, some places still keep that aside and, or let other departments handle it. Uh, but it's definitely a well-accepted field, and by 1986, I published the first edition of Designing the User Interface, my book on the topic, which followed with editions, I think, 98 and 2000, no, I guess, 92, 98, and then the fourth edition, uh, I was joined as co-author uh, with... Catherine Plaisant, who had been my research collaborator since 1980, where is it, 87, 88, something like that. So it's a wonderful collaboration she and I have had, and we've just released the sixth edition this spring. Oh, no, I'm sorry, the fifth edition was just published, and she and I were co-authors. We have two other contributors. But that's been the main textbook in the field and helped define it and put it forward. It has 5,000 citations on Google. Scholar and more, I don't know, but you know, it's widely seen. There are other books, of course, uh, but it's you know, it's told the story of this growing discipline. And people use the five editions as a bit of a historical tableau to look at certain terms and ideas emerging or, or disappearing. So, my satisfaction has been to see that, that go. Now, for me, it was the right place because it was interdisciplinary, bridge multiple disciplines. And uh, it, it produced, uh, I would say, dramatic impact. And I would, you know, it's hard to trace these things directly, but you look at the personal computer and you look then at the cell phone. And while the early edition of the book focused on a, you know, small professional group of users like programmers and medical specialists and air traffic controllers, by the fifth edition, we're talking about four billion cell phone users. You know, <laughs> we're talking about Wikipedia and YouTube, you know, the emergence of these platforms of user-generated content, of social media, and it's just a remarkable transformation for which I'm proud of my role, and it's hard to trace which pieces were mine, but, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to gain the Lifetime Achievement Award from the SIGCHI group and recognition from various sources. There are still recognitions that uh, are, have eluded me, but uh, they may yet come, and I would say in some areas this is still seen as new stuff and not quite science and so on. And soft is a word that's often used, but I would say many other sciences are hard in the sense of being brittle. And this softer science is the direction, I think, for many things to go. And I've written recently about the notion of science 2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the first 400 years of the past of science of physics, chemistry, and so on, controlled laboratory-oriented tests of the natural world were effective, wonderful, and continue. But I suggest there's need for a new way of thinking, which I call science 2.0, 
this was published in the mm -hmm. science of AAAS, mm -hmm. uh, so it had a certain legitimacy that way. And it suggests the content and the methods need to change as well. And mm -hmm. I would say, you know, that my eclectic background gave me the capacity to see this perspective. Not everyone accepts it. I'm criticized from the hard sciences. I'm criticized from the social sciences. Uh, but I would say the notion is probably, you know, in the right direction. And uh, I make some efforts to push that notion forward and make it more acceptable. And so it shifts the methods from controlled replicable laboratory conditions to case studies and interventions in the way that you can do on the web and have 10,000 data points in two hours and uh, it, it gives you remarkable capabilities. I could go on at that, but I think that sort of shows you this trajectory from uh, you know, a traditional computer science to these newer bridging sciences of psychological applications and a larger vision about the transformation of science, always with the intention of making the world a better place. And so those satisfactions where we worked with government agencies, companies, and others to apply these technologies to good purposes and medical care and libraries and museums and education, etc., are a sense of pride for, for me. Uh, I think, as I said, in the opening, that as a profession, it's a difficult trajectory to do because you never, I'll never be accepted as a leader in medical computing. I mean, I'm not a physician, and they, people in that field will dominate it, but I feel like I've made my contribution, and I feel very satisfied with that. And by going from one discipline to another, you start out again as a graduate student, which I'm happy to do, uh, McLuhan, taught me that, of being a dilettante and uh, of being an amateur as a virtue uh, and starting in something new is to me a satisfying part of my everyday work. And so this notion that every few years you look and say, well, we've done a lot of educational computing, we've built these classrooms and environments, published papers, we've done studies, okay, and now we move on. And other things like the hypertext, another contribution I'm proud of, the work that we did on designing hypertext environments in the mid-80s, and our contribution was the link, that certain words on a page or on the screen are highlighted, you click on them and go somewhere, that was our work. Now, okay. Many people had commented on the link, it goes usually traced back to Vannevar Bush's article in 1945, um, which talked about Memex, it was memory, but his notion of the link was you typed in a code number for a document and you, your microfilm device would spin, spin to get you there. Um, we began to develop these electronic encyclopedias and the notion, uh, I, I, there was an aha moment uh, when you know, we had, and that, in those days, a video disc player for the images and we had a plain green screen for the text and we had captions and descriptions and then a numbered list of where you want to go next. And in one screen, there was a very short caption, but a numbered list of name of, of Polish uh, poets, actually. <laughs> and, and it was almost identical, the text in the caption and then the list of the names. And I asked the program at the time, Dan Ostroff, well, how can we get rid of this and then replace them so they would be highlighted in place? And then we click on them, and that was done. And we experimented. We did about a dozen studies comparing different forms of highlighting what colors and bold face and the idea of light blue and underscore was what we developed and Tim Berners-Lee saw that and in his 1989 manifesto for the web he cited our work on that and so it's a small contribution mm -hmm. but it's one it's of those that traveled very mm -hmm. rapidly had a broad mm -hmm. impact and mm -hmm. great satisfaction I mean, this controversy about whether we can take pride in this claim. Uh, others were certainly working on this. Uh, Doug Engelbart mm -hmm. had made kinds of links. Andy Van Dam had made contributions, but we, so we made that particular way of doing it, provided an authoring tool and a rich environment to support all that. And, and that's what you know, became inspiration for, um, for Tim Berners-Lee. Now, we had published this under the term embedded menus, and mm -hmm. Tim was clever enough to call them hot links and mm -hmm and uh, hot spots, and so that caught on and became... Did uh, you know Tim? Yes. Yes. Oh,
Yeah. I mean, he is often uh, in the popular media having the credit as being a founder or discoverer or inventor of the inventor. web. He, deserve, he deserves the credit for it. I would say we were working on these hypertext things that ran on a single computer. And his mind blowing idea that you could have such a link and it would jump to another computer to retrieve this across mm -hmm. a network was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, he made important contributions. I mean, that's certainly true. And I met him even before that, you know, at the Paris Hypertext Conference. And we were at the Hypertext 87 conference as well. We were building these systems called Hypertize, which had a commercial version as well. So we were an active player uh, in those early Hypertext systems. We built the world's first Hypertext scientific journal. The July 88 issue of the communication of the ACM was published as a Hypertext that we created. And we did the world's first electronic book called Hypertext Hands-On, which was actually in a paper form, but it was the disk that mattered. Mm. The paper form was an afterthought. It's the first book in the Library of Congress that has electronic mm. media as part of it. So we definitely made those things happen at scale in commercial and marketable ways, which reached thousands of people, including Tim Berners-Lee. And I'm on his scientific council for the Web Science Research mm. Initiative, so I see him. You're, you're in a perfect position then to ask the question of where now? <laughs> <laughs> what, what are they going to be the big, do you guess, are going to be some of the big developments in the next 10, 20 yeah. years? Well, uh, I've already hinted at some of this in the Science 2.0 argument, but the expansion of social media, of user-generated content, the empowerment of individuals, and the restructuring of social and political norms is, I think, mm. beginning to happen as you take Facebook and YouTube and apply them to national priorities like energy, health, education, energy, uh, sustainability, um, environmental protection, you get a transformative effect. And I think that's what's really dramatic. Uh, in between the fourth and fifth edition of the Design and User Interface book, this just flourished mm -hmm. in a way I would never have predicted that YouTube, which wasn't around five years ago, is now number three on the web after Yahoo and Google, is a startling you know, indicator. You will be on it. <laughs> this interview <laughs> yeah. will be on it soon, too, to join. Sure. So I think those things are you know, only beginning to uh, unwrap in their implications for society. The empowerment of individuals, um, I think, is a, is a transformative effect. Uh, the new forms of media, the dissolution of newspapers in the U.S. and mm. maybe elsewhere as well, and this uh, profound restructuring of, of societal struct, you know, societal mm -hmm. norms. I, I think is um, is yet to be fully appreciated. So we're going down that road, and when journalists, uh, others ask me, what's what's the next killer app? Is the usual yeah, phrase funny. for this. And I have a, a, a straight answer, which is trust, empathy, uh, responsibility, and privacy. Okay? So it's those who understand how to generate trust, how to support empathy, how to make responsibility for failure and success more clear and protect privacy. There are, of course, related notions like motivation. How do you raise the level of motivation so that people participate, contribute? What's the role of egoism, altruism, communalism, as some have labeled them, and how do we make these social structures uh, in new ways, I think is the most direct way. Now, that's an extrapolation of the current directions. I'm, uh, that's, that's more or less the way I see the world. I don't uh, usually indulge in these sort of breakthrough visions of we'll be wearing goggles and glasses mm -hmm. in immersive ways. and brain implants, I kind of, I find that uh, a little far away and maybe not even a good idea. Uh, and I think um, revisiting social structures, political structures, economic structures is the fascinating, potent transformation. How medical care will you know, be changed, how individuals become more responsible for their own medical records and their own medical treatment especially for chronic care cases. Mm. And working on innovative social structures is as interesting to me as innovative algorithms or mm. innovative devices.
prices. So that's the mm. perspective. I've had the satisfaction of seeing our more recent work on visualization become a commercial success story with Spotfire. Mm. The idea which we published in this 1994 paper is still one of the most widely cited in the field with Chris Oldberg, who was a mm. visiting student. And he formed a company in 97 and grew to 200 people and was bought in 2007. I was on the board of directors for the first five years. This is Spotfire. That's right. Mm -hmm. So it's great satisfaction to see a success story like that. And I think people appreciate our lab because we've had not only lots of papers and some good students, and uh, but we've had success stories on the commercial side too, like Spotfire or the tree maps have you know, a dozen commercial instead more probably now and a dozen widely used open source versions and other, many, many other versions of it. So have a web page about the history of tree maps and both our own work and then other people's and it's just to me this fascinating story I'm pleased to be part of your version of the story of how ideas unfold and how they travel or not is remains the intellectual challenge to know which of these which idea will travel well or not and I'm always trying new ones and putting these seeds out there and some go well and others struggle you know, my efforts for several years to work on what we call creativity support tools um, has produced a moderate result and benefit, but it hasn't become a large field. And other ideas like the link on the web or the notion of human-computer interaction, some ideas are small focused, others are broader and sort of restructuring of disciplines are another notion. But what is it that makes an idea attractive? Some people think my phrasing, wording, journalism style, speaking, public speaking approach makes it successful. Or I do good demos, you know, <laughs> which is said as a kind of criticism. Hmm. Okay? Um, but I think, you know, finding ideas and developing them in a way that has an impact and then communicating it effectively is, is what our job is. And so I work on that. And sometimes it works well, <laughs> and sometimes you struggle and still want to get ideas out there. And it seems appropriate that you've written a book called Leonardo's Laptop. Mm -hmm. um, you could hail you as a Leonardo of our age, with your diverse interests and enormous energy and, and skills. So I think that would be a lovely point to end. Thank you very much indeed, Ben. And thank you for the opportunity, Alan.